in my DNA from above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. Oh, yeah. Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby. I'm Al McGlushen and this is Fishing with Mates. <laughs> G'day, I'm Al McGlushen and welcome to my second podcast. Now, do you know what? I've got to say, I'm pretty excited. I got that first podcast out of the way few mishaps along the way. You should have seen me trying to edit it. It was a nightmare. But we got it done. And you know what? The response has been absolutely overwhelming. Now, over the years, I've done a bit of radio, but I've, to be honest, I've always focused with, with the visual side, with TV, with books, magazines, photography, all that side. And to go the other way, where it's just purely audio and you poor buggers just have to listen to my voice, God help you all, I have to say I'm absolutely amazed. No, you know what? I'm overwhelmed by the response that everyone has been so interested in all that. Look, it is the perfect life. I'll never, ever deny it. It is hard work, but it is a great lifestyle. And the one thing is, and I keep saying this, is that I want to use this podcast to inspire others to get out there, enjoy nature, turn their passion into a career, but do it in a way that we look after the environment as well and go fishing and hunting and get your own food. Bloody awesome, I tell you. So thank you to everyone that has come on board, that's sent messages, that's subscribing, that's sending us things on Instagram and Facebook and all the others. Bloody unreal. So what are we going to do this week? What are we going to talk about? Because we've gone through the humble beginnings, you know, how my dad introduced myself and my brother Stu into fishing and hunting and how it became entrenched in our lives and how the interesting thing is he's in the industry as well or another industry, but still in the outdoor industry. And at my end, how it evolved into that passion turned into the business of what it is today into McGlashan Media. Well, you know what? This time, I'm going to go through some of those highlights, well, some of those sort of the pinnacles of my career. Now, I'm not talking about when I got fishing with mates on Netflix. I'm not talking about when I finally got on TV, when I first did, you know, Channel 31 way back in the early days with Strike Zone. Instead, it's the images or those single experiences that just became a pinnacle for what I'm doing that just raised it to the next level. And there are a couple of places and images that really, really stand out that I suppose you could say that help make the career. And the interesting thing is that it's all about being in the right spot at the right time. Everyone says, you know, oh, you did this, you're you're lucky. You make your own luck in this business. I'll tell you that straight out. The smarter you are, the more you prepare and the more you seize the opportunity, the luckier you are. So if you, like, and this is in business as well, this isn't just taking photos, and it's fishing. God, it is so much fishing. The more time I print, the more time that I spend preparing and getting ready, the better I am at seizing those opportunities. So look at it this way. We're going marlin fishing. It's marlin season here in New South Wales right now, and we're getting ready. We've done a few days. We haven't had the best luck so far. We've been, because we're chasing bait bulls to do more underwater footage. And you know what? We've been driving around them a little bit. But the key is that the other day, Jim and Tom and all the crew, everyone came around and we made all the leaders. We prepped all the boat. Even yesterday, I was fixing, God, fixing stuff on my boat. It seems to be an endless chore. I was fixing, you know, broken switches and pumps and all that to make sure that when we're on the water, everything works. All the leaders are done. We've reset all the lines. So I've put suffix 24 and 37 because we only fish heavy over here. Checked everything so it's all brand new. In fact, you know what? Just as, and I haven't even started talking about the photos. 
this is one little tip for everyone marlin fishing, but don't worry, we're going to do a whole episode on it. But for marlin fishing, I backspool all my reels with braid with suffix 832, and then I top spool it with mono. What that means I can do is then I can just chop and I can just change it out. So what I mean by that is catch a few marlin, cut off the top 100 metres of mono, put fresh mono on. I buy 1,000 metres of mono, that's 10 times I can fill the spool up. Now, if I'd go on the normal way, the old traditional way, where it's all mono, I have to keep changing 1,000 metres a line. Do you know how expensive that is? Bloody hell, it's ridiculous. And it has taken the Game Fishing Association of New South Wales the most ridiculously long time to come up to terms with changing the rules to match the to match what everyone's doing. Thank God they've finally come up with it. I tell you, game fishing in this country really needs to step up a bit. It's so frustrating that we're so antiquated with what we do and killing fish and everything the wrong way. If you kill it, you eat it. God, I'm digressing again. This is what I did last time when I went through my whole thing. You know, I spent all the time going off this way, going off that way. Okay, let's get back to it. I'm going back online. I'm going straight down where I should be. And that is talking about those pinnacle moments in my career changed everything I do. You know what? The actual first photo I took, we spoke about in last week's podcast, which was that photo, that classic photo of the guy getting speared up the bum, straight up the clacker. And the funny thing is, because that was slide film, and we went through that, being all slide film, but I suppose I should just touch on how we got the shot, because this is important, and it's reading the situation. So we're out of Broken Bay, the sour is blowing up everywhere. The fishing is going off. There are striped marlin all over the place smashing them. It is insane fishing. Now, we're trolling lures because when they're on souries, so souries like a garfish, like a needlefish that jump around, marlin love them. And when they're on these, you don't live bait, you just troll lures because they're so fixated, they'll chase stuff down. We've got marlin blowing up everywhere. I think we got three or four for the day already. Anyway, we're trolling along, got a double hook up, made it a triple. As with Lewis Stripe Marlin, they fall off. It's a standard thing. So we've got one on. We're getting him up close to the boat. And the bloke driving the boat pulls it out of gear. Now, remember, a Marlin cannot stop swimming. They're perpetual swimmers. They just swim forward for their whole lives. All of a sudden, it the boat stopped. I'm thinking, what are you doing? So I've raced down the back and I've angled myself next to him the guy tagging good old Murray and Ian was on the rod, I think in these days, one of my other mates. And in an effort to get the fish, they're yelling at him to step over to tag. The fish is sitting in the water. And I've thought, and I've got a wide angle on at this stage thinking, you know what? This fish is going to jump. I'm going to get a great shot with the guy, the other fisherman, the tag, the guy tagging it and the fish all in one shot. This is going to be unreal. So, Getting in position, the fish jumps. The first shot's this lovely shot. And I'll put all this on Instagram so you can see it. Well, actually, I think it's already on there. It's on Al McGlashan. And it's got the shot where he comes up and the fish is leaning away and I've taken the shot. And then the next thing, the fish has swung the other way and he's come up over the transom, screaming up. At the same time, poor old Murray has got one foot on the transom, on the marlin board, and one foot inside. So he's straddling the stern of the boat in not the best position, I can tell you, the marlins come up and hit him square in the bum with its bill. Now, you look at it and go, and you can see the creases in the shot, like you could see it. But the amazing thing is, it didn't actually go, it didn't pierce the skin, thankfully for Murray, because its bottom jaw was hitting the back of the boat. And that's what saved Murray. And you sit there thinking, I can't believe it. And then, of course, the next shot, the fish falls down. The funny thing is, it snapped off, swam off, so the fish didn't get. The fish never got tagged, and it's the only time in history that the fish tagged the angler and not the fish being tagged at all. So, talk about role reversals. And I still remember, and I know I said this last week, but I'm going through it again because I still love these shots. Sitting there in the in the suite, waiting for the the photo, the processing suite for the waiting for my roll of film to come out, my positives, and looking at it, or negatives, I should say, and looking at it going, oh, my God, that is it. I've got it. And, of course, it got published in Sport Fishing Mag with Doug Olander, and it's been all around the world, and, yeah, it was that was pretty amazing. So that would have to go down as my first, my first proper photo, I suppose you could say. You know, I wouldn't say the only one, but it's the first one, 
And if you're looking back, if you want to take something out of this as a photographer or someone that, you know, for a fisherman, is the boat went out of gear. That fish was going to do something 100%. There was no question something was going to happen. Now, whether it jumped away, whether it jumped left or right, or whether it jumped straight in the boat is something that we don't, we just can't pick. You know, you just don't know. And I tell you what, it was just, oh, that second, you know, when you've got it, it's just amazing. And to this day, I think it's the only photo, to be honest, I think it's the only photo in the world of someone getting speared square up the clacker. Thanks, Murray. You did a good job for us. The next photo would have to be, no, it's actually a series of photos. Would have to be one of the most amazing. I think it was the location that played a massive role in this. So when I started fishing with mates, it was with which is a TV show which is on Channel Nine. It's been on Netflix. It's on Sportsman's Channel over the US, uh, and it's on in New Zealand as well. Is that we decided that we wanted to go to locations that had literally been never untouched, places that you only dream about. And we're thinking about, you know, the Galapagos, but there's so many rules and regulations that just make it a misery. So then we went and found Ascension Island. Now, this isn't a single image. I'll admit, this is actually a series of shots. So back in the days when I first started Fishing With Mates. Now, Fishing With Mates is my TV series, which we run on uh, the major networks here in Australia. It's it's over in New Zealand, it's on in the US on Sportsman's channel, and of course on Netflix as well. When we started this series, because before that I did Big Fish, Small Boats, we wanted to make a series that we went to the most amazing locations on earth and fished with your mates, hence the name. And it was we ended up, I was looking at it because it was sort of one of those things, you know, where do we go? We looked at the Galapagos we're um and and there were so many rules and regulations there that I just went, this is too hard. And then we're looking at Mexico. Again, there was sort of the areas we wanted to go are sort of you can't do this, you can't do that. And then out of the blue came up a place called Ascension Island. In all my life, this is the most unique places on earth. It is out of this world. Like I cannot describe how unique it is. And what happened was a couple of spearfishing mates had been over there and reported seeing massive yellowfin. And I mean, you're talking 100 plus kilo jobs here. That's 230 odd pound fish just swimming around you, like insane fish. And they'd been spearing them saying that that was so easy. They just swam up and just shot them in the head. That was it. Not sure that's really sport if they swim up that close. But anyway, this became my idea. Now, on top of that was my 40th birthday. In my job, you get sponsored, so you get lots of stuff. So what do you get as a birthday present? Well, Rach, my better half, had decided at the time, let's send Al to the most amazing place. Everyone puts in, that's it. He picks it and goes. And that's where the Galapagos idea came from. We thought about it and thought, this would be a really good idea. And yeah, it was a bit sort of, you know, Galapagos just rules and regulations, and I don't like tours. I like going to amazing places and meeting the locals. I don't want to go on a tourist thing. That's crap. I want to meet the locals and see the real country, not the tourist route. So that was out. And of course, Ascension had popped up. So I contacted the guys over there. Kyle was running an operation over there and said, oh, you know, what's the deal? How is it? I was hoping in those days that we'd get a free one. Not a chance in hell. Ascension, this is a bloody expensive place. You know, it's a tough gig. And so we worked on it and I went, I sat down and, of course, with Fishing With Mates as well. And originally, I was actually going to do it separate to it. That was my original plan. But then, sitting down with Brad Cohen, who was uh, my sort of shooter producer, I said, mate, what are you doing? We need to go and do this trip. This is the one we have to do. So I went, yeah, let's do it. So it went from me going on the adventure of my lifetime to where the whole film crew came. And we went to the US first and we did all this stuff. And... We ended up, it took, it was such a mission to get there. Now, Ascension Island is a tiny little island in the South Atlantic, about a million miles from anywhere. Strategically, it's really important because it's halfway between South America and Africa. So st strategic wise, it is an absolute gem. In fact, would you believe 
that when Napoleon got chucked over and, you know, when he got locked up, they put him on St. Helena Island, which is over closer to Africa, and they put a garrison on Ascension Island, which was nothing more than a bloody rock in the middle of nowhere. You know, it just, I couldn't have think it, thought of anything worse, but that was the only way the people, the French could go and save Napoleon was to go through Ascension. Luckily, that's all done and dusted now. So we got on a plane, we flew from, because we were fishing in America at the time, from Miami to um, to England, and then went out to I think it was Bras and it was Bras and Norton, which is the military because it's a military base. You just don't fly there. Hopped on a plane, a massive plane, and flew another nine hours into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to Ascension. And we had to get special permission because this is the interesting part. It's an English territory, but the Americans own the airstrip. In fact, you know what? They can even land shuttles that have flown into space there because that's the jump over or the, you know, if, it, if they don't get land in, uh, was it Cape Canaveral? If they don't land there, they land at Ascension. Like, wow, what a place this is. So we had to have all this special permission because there's all secret squirrel business going on there and, you know, you can't do anything. You can't do this. You can't do that. We can't film anything, even though Google Earth, you could see all the stuff. That was the funny part. Told we can't film anything, but Google Earth, you could see the whole island. So I don't understand what they'll complain about. Anyway, got it all done. We'd ordered, I think, a thousand pounds, what, two and a half grand or three grand's worth of bait from South Africa sardines. And the whole idea of this trip was to film giant yellowfin underwater. So we met up with Cole. Everything's all organized. You know, we're getting ready to go. We've got all the camera gear ready. Walked down to the water with him and said, oh, what's the deal? You know, do we meet you at 5 a.m. go out? And he goes, no, 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 9 o'clock, we just cruise out. I'm like, oh, 9 o'clock? What? Anyway, get in the boat. He's got his kids in the boat, no life jackets. Do you know what a problem that is for us when we film? When you make TV, the, the trolls will complain about anything, anything they can find because they've got such boring crap lives, they just love whinging. So, and... A 10-year-old or 15-year-old without a life jacket is going to cause troubles. So I said, oh, Cole, you know, we have to shoot around them. This isn't part of what we do. You know, it's not obviously our responsibility to your boat, but we can't shoot. No, no, she'll be right. So it's like, right, so that's a press problem. We're only in a small boat, so we're trying to shoot around this. And then the next thing, I said, all right, now what do we do? We cut up these pilchards, really, these sardines really small. We throw them over. He goes, oh, no, no, I forgot a knife. I'll just scrunch a few up and we'll see what happens. By this stage, I'm thinking... We are never going to see a giant yellowfin. This is not going to happen. We've got no chance. And I'm sitting there going, what are we going to do? I said, oh, how long does it take for these tuna to turn up? And he goes, oh, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Bear in mind, we're like 500 metres offshore, 500 metres off where we launched. I'm looking going, oh, this is not good. This is so not good. What are we going to do here? And he turns around and within five minutes, he looks outside and goes, ah, yeah, they're not real big and drives off. I've looked over the back and there's all these 25, 30 kilo yellowfins swimming around the back of the boat and we've just driven away from them. I'm like, no, no, turn around. He goes, what do you mean? We'll get a bigger one than that. I never realised what was going to happen. In the space of the next few days, I think we were there seven, eight days, we saw 100 kilo yellowfin every day bar two. Every single day we went out, they swam around the boat. Like in my whole life, I've never, ever imagined anything like it. You just cruise out, start cubing, and up comes this monster, this jumbo yellowfin. And probably the best day, and this is the day when I got the shots that I just dream about, as we were fishing, and Sundal, Benson, and Jamie were in the boat next to us, and they were fishing away as well. And they've called up and said, oh, we've got these big sharks around the boat. Come over. And we'd, we'd had a lot of small yellowfin that day. You know, there were smaller ones swimming around and 25 kilo fish. Like, you could hand feed them. So we said, oh, rightio. Came over. And at first, the guys thought they were tiger sharks. No, they're huge Galapagos whalers, which a Galapagos shark in the Pacific Ocean is a small, annoying, rather aggressive at times, little pain in the ass shark. In the Atlantic Ocean, they're much bigger and look somewhat more like a, I don't know, a dusky whaler, maybe a bronze whaler. So anyway, so we've got them. They've come up around the boat. There's smaller yellowfin everywhere, you know, those 25 kilo jobs. 
And I've said to Cole, do you mind if I jump in and film? And he's like, oh, not, not with the sharks. I went, no, nah, they'll be right. They won't do So I've slipped in the water. The sharks will, as they normally do, they back off. Everyone thinks sharks are aggressive. They're not. Nine times out of ten, they'll back off from you and stay well clear. And these sharks step right back. So I'm in the water trying to film these little yellow fin. And then and the sharks are sort of on the edge. And then all of a sudden, the sharks di- disappeared. The yellow fin dropped down. And I'm sitting there on my own. You know that feeling where you're just, there's nothing around you. And I'm starting to edge back towards the boat thinking, oh, if something scared those sharks off, I'm not real happy about this. You know, this could be really bad. And then up comes a yellow fin that I'm talking 120, maybe 130 kilos, like close to 300 pounds. This thing with sickles down to its tail just comes up and swims past me looking at me. All the little yellowfin racing around it as well, which now look tiny. They're 25, 35 kilo fish, but now they look like they're three kilos. And this massive fish just swims past. It's just, in all my life, I've just, it's, oh my God, it's insane to see fish like this. Something about yellowfin with those beautiful big sickles. That is just so cool. And I'm sitting there filming it going, oh my God. Of course, I'm saying it through the snorkel. So everyone in the boat thinks I'm either being eaten by a shark or talking absolute rubbish as usual until they saw the yellow fin as well. Like it was massive. It just comes up and swims around and just unfazed. And so I'm taking photos. Brad's jumped in to do underwater as well. And we're filming this monster. Oh, and the photos that I've got unbelievable video because it just swims up to me at one stage it swims right up beside me looks at me and eats a cube like a little bit of sardine right in front of me and i'm just going click 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 going this is the most amazing fish i've ever seen in my life and then i got shots where it it came up the surface and was eating them off the surface in front of me and the sickles on this thing and just swimming around and there's one shot where it comes right up and you'll see it it just swims and you'll see it on instagram And it comes up and just turns right beside me. So you see the sheer size of this fish. And you look at it going, that is absolutely insane. Like it just out of this world. And the funny thing is, I ran out of fuel, like I've ran out batteries, drained everything, got back in the boat. Brad goes, you're going to have to catch that. I went, no, no, all I want to do is film it. I don't want to catch it. I just want to feel it. goes, you got a fishing show. Fishing shows you catch fish. I'm going, I don't want to catch that. All I want to do is film it. And the funny thing is now, I don't want to catch big yellowfin. All I want to do is film them. And I fought that fish. for. It took us ages to hook it up. We had to hold the bait out of the water. It's insane footage, which is back on, what is it, season one we did that? Yeah, season one, Ascension Island. We had to end up holding the bait out of the water. And just as it came past, it dropped in the water to hook this thing. I fought this monster for three hours until the the line snapped. Thank God it's still swimming around out there because we're going to tag it anyway, but... What a magic fish. And I still, the only regret I've got out of that whole experience is that I didn't just keep filming. Instead of putting myself through the pain on spin gear, my poor old Stella, you should have seen the poor old Shimano Stella. It was absolutely, oh, we were giving it a hard time on that fish. What? Well, yeah, it was just out of this world. But just as a side note, how funny is this? So we did the whole, you know, got the shots i'm looking through it it's unreal got all the shots and then here is this shot of a yellowfin not the big one a smaller one that's a split shot so with a split shot you've got the sky above you've got the fish underneath and the water rolling across the lens and i've got this absolutely perfect shot of a smaller yellowfin with the water in the sky so where the two worlds collide and i still i actually remember taking the shot and never thought another thing of it until I saw it later on that night on the computer. So that trip for big yellow fin and spectacular shots seriously rocked my world. It wasn't like, you know, a spectacular shot, I suppose, like getting someone speared, but it was one of those moments where you just go, this place is amazing. And do you know what? They've locked it up now. Ascension Island's closed down. I'm pretty sure it's because Trump and all the, you know, for security have locked it down because it's too important. Apparently, the airstrip, you can't land. 
So everything that was building and there were charters building, it was just starting to grow into a real little amazing location. Very hard to get to. You have to have special permission. You can't just fly there. There is rumours it will open again, but sadly at this time it's still closed and it's such a disappointment that such an amazing place that we need to look after it. But wow, what a location. And I'm sitting in now and the photo of that fish is sitting on the wall right in front of me. And that's what I love about photography is it captures that moment, especially with fishing and, and filming, is those moments when I see these fish and and I come back and tell people about it. They go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. There's only so much I can say in my voice, as you can tell. But to actually have the photo to show them and go, that's what it is, everyone goes, holy moly, that is insane. And that's what I love about photography, especially when it's huge tuna. All right, the next one. Now, this is a really interesting one because it's got a whole lot of side stories to it because not that I get, you know, not that I digress and go the wrong way at times. It includes a squid. And it was one that just came out purely, I'd almost say by accident. So we were, how do we start this? This is an interesting story. So it started with, we're out fishing down out of Jarvis Bay and I had my good mate Brian from Winchester and one of his mates out and we're out chasing tuna, found the tuna and we we trolled over them a few times, couldn't get them, they were yellowfin, we're actually looking for bluefin at the time and we're trying to get the bites, anyway, it's not working so we've gone over them a few times, they haven't gone off so I've rigged up a live, I said as we go over the top of these fish, pitch the livey. Right, as we've gone over, I marked them, they're blown up around the boat, going, pitch the livey, pitch the livey. Everyone stood there. I've run down the back, thrown the livey out, and the livey's gone flying under the boat. I've gone, oh, you bloody ripper. Grabbed it again and thrown it out, and the water's just exploded on it like a big yellowfin zenith. It's like, beautiful. Right, give him the rod. So we've hooked up the yellowfin. He's winding it up. He's got the boat, and somehow the reel's got to free spool. I reckon he did it. He reckon I did it. We're not sure who's in ch- who's actually at fault, but the end result is I went to push the drag up. Th- the reel's over one because the fish is now screaming off and the line's caught my finger or caught my thumb, I should say, and dragged it into the spool. Now, can you imagine what that does? 50 Tigra, Shimano 50 Tigra has got your thumb and it's got the top plate and it's being sanded down. It's like going over a sanding belt, just being shaved off as this fish screams off. And the end result is I lost the end off my thumb, like shaved down through the nail into the bone, all that. Didn't think of it initially because all I wanted was get the fish. Got the fish wound up, went to gaff it, and the other bloke on board staring at Brian and I going, your thumb, your thumb. I go, don't worry about the bloody thumb. Let's get this fish. Get the gaff quick. Let's get it up. I've turned around and gone, I can see the bone sticking out the end of my finger. Uh-oh. And this, I'm not going off on a tangent. This is actually, this is an important part of the story. And I've gone, oh, no. So I put a rag over it. We've got the yellow fin up and I've gone, rightio, um, I can't really gaff it. I'll lead her at one handed. And then Brian goes, no, I'll lead her at. The other blokes wasn't really helping much at that stage. Goes, oh, well, I'll, um, uh, I said, rightio, you lead her, I'll gaff. So I went to gaff, but as soon as I took the rag off my hand, blood's come out everywhere. So we've got the yellow fin beside the boat. Brian's trying to lead her at and bring it in in gaffing range. I've taken... The, um, the rag off my thumb, blood's come out everywhere. Brian and I went A over T. Both of us slipped over in the blood, not the fish's blood, my blood, and now the fish has screamed off again. So I've got it back up, got the rag on it, said, righty I'm going to have to lead it. You're going to gaff it. Got it back up, bang, lifted, and it was I don't know, 45, 50 kilos or something like that. And I didn't really think that much of my thumb at that stage, but then when we started to look at it, we realised we'd done a bit of damage. So to make a long story short, because we didn't catch any more yellowfin that day, so that's the important part out, is that went back, thought I'd better go to hospital, ended up going to a specialist, ended up having a skin graft on the end of my hand, and the next week, so I had major surgery on it, and they, what they did was they took a chunk out of my my bicep, out of my arm, and stitched that onto the end of my thumb to try and fill basically fill the hole. And this is why it comes back to the important part of the story is that what happened was 
is that when in, and the important thing is when you do a skin graft is you've got to give it time for the, I suppose, the two parts to join together to actually, you know, to mend, I suppose you could say. I'm not, as you can tell, I'm not a doctor. So I've done it all, gone back in, had all the surgery. Doctor said, rightio, it's looking good. You need to do nothing for four days. This is on a Thursday. Monday morning, you're coming in to see us. And I said, oh, when can I fish? He goes, you can't go fishing. You can't get it wet for a couple of days. I went, right, okay, that's it. The boat was still down at Jarvis Bay at this stage. I'm thinking, oh, you know what? Friday, so this is one day of the thing. I thought, he didn't say the next four days. So the next day, I went, right, that's it, driving down to Jarvis Bay. That's cruising down. Went down, weather's dead flat, and went, I could go fishing, you know. I could just sneak out for a quick fish. And, yep, grabbed the camera crew, grabbed everyone that I could, went fishing. I'm just going to keep it dry. That's my theory. Not probably the best approach, but definitely a good idea. So we're out fishing. It's pretty quiet. Found a few albacore. My mate Corey Young from Club Marine was with me, so which was good. He caught a few albacore. I'm trolling along, and I could see a couple of albatross, wandering albatross. Now, wandering albatross are the really big ones. They're monsters, and they've got the white head. But one thing, if you ever see a bunch of them sitting on the water, there is something dead. In the past, I've found makos eating swordfish. I've found dead fish, whatever you want to name it. If they're all together, there's something there. So I looked up in the distance, spotted them. Of course, at sea, in, with fishing, you're always searching offshore for birds. Birds are the signpost in the sky. Saw it and went, hello, something's going on up there. As we're getting closer, we've realised it's a giant squid. Now, I'm talking giant as in... This thing is about 30 foot long. It is massive. It's absolutely huge. So as we're coming closer and going, holy moly, look at the size of this this squid. And it's nothing on it. There's no fish on it, just the birds pecking away at it and eating it. So we pulled up beside it and I started doing a piece to camera about how amazing it is and look at the size of this squid and I can't believe anything's eating it. Everyone's laughing at me. I'm going, what are you talking about? Turn around, there's a blue shark eating it. It's come up out of nowhere and just starts chewing on it. So we film the blue shark. We film the giant squid. You know, just the things you see on the open ocean are just so amazing. Did all the shots, videoed it, did everything. It was all pretty cool. Didn't think much of it, except we thought, let's take the beak because oh, maybe I can donate that to science or something like that because you never see giant squid whole. You see bits of them quite often but you never see whole giant squid. So we thought we'll take the beak. And anyway, so we took the beak, which is now in the Australian Museum in Sydney. There you go, because we donated to They loved it. They wanted the whole squid. We couldn't put it on board. It was massive. The size of the boat wouldn't even fit in the boat. But we did that. Didn't even think much about it. Went back and I rang my mate Mal Holland. So my column in the Daily Telegraph, Gone Fishing with Al McGlashan, which is in the Sydney um, Daily Telegraph, I should say, for everyone overseas. It's also online and it also gets syndicated out to all the other magaz- uh, all the other papers as well. I rang Mal and said, oh, we've got this giant squid. You should do a little write-up for it. And he goes, that's a brilliant idea. So he did a write-up for it. And on the Monday, it came out. And this is the same Monday I meant to go back and see the doctor first thing in the morning. And you know if something's created a media interest because the, the unwritten rule is the media will start ringing you at 6 o'clock. So I've sort of got up 6 o'clock, about to make coffee, phone starts ringing. Oh, we'd like to talk to you about the giant squid. Oh, we want to do this, we want to do that. And I'm going, what the, what, what's going on here? Hang on a second. And all of a sudden, the media starts, the media storm started. So on another note, what I decided to do was to put a little bit of footage up. You know, we filmed it, might as well add a bit on, put it on YouTube. And put it, I think the title was, Shark eats giant squid, something like that. Something dramatic, you know. Not quite what it is, but the dramatic side gets them all fired up. And didn't think of it. Started doing interviews in the morning. Looked at the post a bit later on or looked at YouTube a bit later on and it had like 10,000 views. I went, wow, that's pretty good. Looked at it again like in an hour. It went up to a million views. I'm going, what the hell? It screamed up like you've never seen before. It ended up 
in a day, I think it was 6.9 million views and it's something like 10 million views now in a day. And then, of course, the, the photos went everywhere. And that one's more video, I suppose. But the, the way the world went crazy for it was absolutely unreal. And you know the funny part? It took me all but it took me completely by surprise because I wasn't organized for it. I just chucked it on there, thought, oh, that'll do, you know, that's it. We took it to uh, the Sydney Museum because they were absolutely overjoyed because they don't get that. They don't get these giant peaks. Well, they don't get to see giant squid because very rare to even see them. So I think that's one thing that fishermen can help is that we can find these things at sea. And if we can help with science, if we can help with, you know, anything along those lines with the universities, with anything, we can do it. So, of course, they've got it now. And it's sitting there now in the Sydney Museum. How good is that? It's still on YouTube to this day on Al McGlashan's page. And it's nothing special. You know what? When it first went up, it actually still had insert text here because I didn't know how to take it off. That's how switched on I was for the number one. And it's a really interesting one because it was basically nature and the raw and something that I never, ever thought I'd see. And it still stands out as one of those experiences in life that you just go, holy crap, that was insane. Life-threatening maybe, but I'll tell you what, and it is the Mako eating the marlin and being in the water for it. So where does it all start? Where did, what happened on this day? Well, the funny part is there's actually another element to it because I got other good shots on the same day. It was one of those days where everything came together. Now, with marlin fishing, it's changed so much over the years. It's all about catch and release and, you know, tagging fish so we can learn about it for science. And you know what? It's anglers that are leading the way and showing that tagging is important because we learn about these fish. We can't look after them if we don't learn about them and understand them. If we understand their behaviours, behaviors, their movements, we can protect them better. And you know what really frustrates me? It's citizen science coming from anglers Yet all you hear is these greenies carrying on, sitting in their urban environment, lipping on lattes, or sipping on lattes, not lipping on lattes, sipping on lattes, complaining about what everyone else is doing. Well, get off your asses and stop whinging and get out there, roll your sleeves up and help. We can't fix it by sitting on the internet being a troll, just going, oh, the world should change. Do something. Get out there and be a part of it. Clean up the plastic on the beach or like I do every day at the boat ramp. Or get out there and be a part of the science and research so we can understand these fish better. And you know what? That means tagging them, not locking it up. It's funny. Every week I'm going to have a go at these greens because what they're doing is wrong. And I really get frustrated that they think a marine park's going to fix all these things like pollution. Runoff. It's still running straight in the marine park. Fix the problem. Don't put an imaginary fence up there because it doesn't fix the bloody problem. Righty, back to it. Sorry, I'm always going to do it. I really do get frustrated with those people, though, that they live in the most change environment world, using up all our resources to keep themselves comfortable and happy and then complain about it. Get out and help with us. That's what I'm saying. Righty, greenies aside, back to it. So tagging marlin has been a massive thing. In Australia, the New South Wales tagging program, I think it's been going since the 73. It's massive. They've tagged out hundreds of thousands of fish. It's such a benefit. And while it's it's not as good as it used to be because we should be doing more satellite tagging, et cetera, et cetera, all these fancy things, but I will go into that in another story. It won't be in this podcast. What we were doing on this day was I had Phil Bolton, 40, he's a copper, and Roddy Finlay. And we were up at Port Stephens and we were filming how to catch and release marlin properly for the for the Game Fishing Association. The idea is to show everyone the exact steps you do to make sure to ensure those fish live. The important thing is that it was all about education because if you teach them, they're better at it. And the funny thing is, on the way up, I had to meet up, I had a meeting, you know, a production meeting with, I can't remember who it was, someone. And I just got my underwater housing from Aquatech. So they make the housings for my, my SLRs. And I thought, why don't I buy a bit of mounting and put, in those days, I think it was called a, it was a little underwater camera on the side. And I don't even remember what the name was. It was before GoPros. So it's a couple of years ago now. 
And I thought, you know what? I'm going to mount that on the side. Just put it up there on the side. So I went and met him, went to Bunnings, got a few little bits and pieces and built this little frame. So I had the camera and on the side mounted was a little action cam sort of style on the side. And then... Headed straight to Port Stephens. Next day, we're out fishing, and I've got a little camera, another one, called a VO, I think it was, and that was mounted on the side of the boat. So that filmed everything going on. And then, of course, I had the one on the underwater housing. So the first thing to happen, and this is before the shark, we're driving along, and I've looked out the back. We're live baiting at a place, I should say, called the car park. Now, the car park gets its name. It's 24 miles to the southeast, I think it is, of Port Stephens thankfully way outside the marine park if you want to talk about bad marine parks what they've done to port stevens the inshore grounds they have completely stuffed it up i mean completely stuffed up this used to be an amazing tourism place because you go fishing catch a few fish let them go to where they've locked it up jammed everyone out of there you can't do anything in this place and now they've got so bad do you know that these nazi like fisheries officers well, I think they were Marine Parks officers originally, I don't know what they're called now, would go around and book people. You get, in Australia, this is how bad it is, you get charged 500 bucks as a criminal offence just for driving through a Marine Park zone, like a, a sanctuary zone with a rod. So here I am, all the years I've promoted fishing, I've always promoted to have all your gear ready to go. Well, when I mean ready to go, like rigged and all that, a rigged rod in a sanctuary zone in New South Wales is a $500 fine because apparently you're fishing. How bad is that? No wonder anglers are up in arms in this country. We're about protecting things, but that's just draconian. Anyway, actually, you know what? Let's tell people about it. So at Port Stephens, at the main boat ramp at Little Beach there, they put the sanctuary zone all the way around it so you can't actually get to the boat ramp. And then... In the past, these officers have sat there and booked families and kids and everyone for having a rod. And the rules actually state, this is how bad it is, it has to be below deck if it's rigged. How do you put it below deck? I'm in it. What about the bloke in a tinny? What, because he can't afford a massive cruiser and can't put his gear below deck? He has to cut off. And when I mean rigged, the rules are nothing can be attached to your line. So I'm talking a swivel, a sinker. What is wrong with these people? Who came up with these rules? We're meant to be getting more kids out fishing and here we have these idiots trying to ban it. No wonder I hate these radical greenies. This is just so stupid. It is madness. So we drove out and let me tell you, I left all my rods rigged and I drove straight through that sanctuary zone because it's wrong. And we went out to sea. It was kind of ironic that we had fisheries on board, had police on board and Roddy Finlay was there as well, who's a gun fisherman, I'd say semi-professional deckhand. He's done it for a while, but all he does is go fishing these days. So we went straight through that marine park. No officers in sight, too scared to take us on. Bloody idiots they are. Went out and went to the car park. Now, that's where I was. Car park, 24 miles offshore to the south-southeast. And what it is, is just a few square miles that the bait, which are slimy mackerels in Australia, uh, overseas you'd call them, Tinker mackerel or chub mackerel, it's the same mackerel. I think in, in England, they actually turn them into, that's what smoked mackerel is in Europe. In fact, you know what? Phil Bolton eats the bait. I know it sounds weird, but if we don't use all the slimies and let them go, he guts them and takes them home. And he's a pom. Does that explain a lot for you? Anyway, let's go back to it. Let's get to the action. So we're out on the car park. Where I think we're live baiting at this time. So we've got a long bait, short bait, and I'm going to do a whole show just on catching marlin, on tips and techniques and how to do it better in New South Wales or East Coast Australia. So out there, and I've looked out the back, and we've got a stainless prop on, on the outboard, and right behind it, there's a marlin with literally his nose in against the prop. Because the stainless flashes, it attracts them. I've looked at it and gone, because all the gear's ready, just gone holy moly there's fish that jumped over the side so i'm in the water this marlin swims past and then he's half interested in the baits but then he's totally interested in me so i filmed this beautiful striped marlin and the best part is he swam right up to have a look at me and just turned right in front of me and because i use wide angle you've got to get really close underwater and i've got these great photos of this beautiful striped marlin just swim past me 
Like, how magic is that? Just one of those things I just go, oh, it, I can't describe how awesome it is being in the water with a marlin, like with a free-swimming wild marlin. They never attack you. They're curious. But the gracefulness that they have in the water is absolutely out of this world. So the marlin's cruised around. He's had a look at me. I've shot these photos, got some video. Like, tick the box. This is a good day already. Because, you know, with that filming, it's always so hard. You're just trying to get good footage. And you get days, you get nothing. You get days where the footage fails. Already we've got something in the can. This is a good day. So anyway, back in the boat, he's disappeared. Didn't get a bite off him for some reason. Just curious, whatever. Maybe he'd been hooked before. Who knows? Going along. Bang, rig comes down, hooked up. Striped marlin starts jumping and carrying on. It's like, oh, beauty. I'm the wheel this time. So we're chasing this fish around. And with striped marlin, once you get close, you know, you can normally, they'll tire and they'll go down sea. Mark the second fish on the sounder. So when I say marked, on your furuno, on your fish finder, there's a mark which is the echo bouncing off another fish below. So you marked a fish below. I've gone, mark it a fish. There he is. Gone right quick. We dropped another bait down to try and get two on. I know it's greedy, but we want two fish on. And we've got it ready to go. And as we do, we don't get a bite. And the fish we're on screams off. It's like, oh, man, you're in the car park because a lot of boats there at times. It wasn't too bad then. Scotty was on um, Freedom nearby fishing and, you know, so there's not too many. Anyway, and Adam was out. Adam Polly was out as well. And we're like, oh, man. So we've pulled the bait up, raced after this fish, got up close because you don't want too much line out because another, another boat might run him over. So we've got it back up, mark the fish again. It's like, oh, there's another striped marlin, quick drop bait. Same thing happens. The fish just screams off and we don't get a bite. Like, oh, this is really weird. This went on three times. Three times we marked the second fish. Three times we didn't get a bite and three times our fish bolted, which normally they don't do because they're, they're happy that there's another striped marlin there. Finally, we said, radio, ignore the other one. Let's just get this bloody fish out of the way. This is damn hard work. Finally got him up beside the boat. He's carrying on. He's making everything hard. Gets him beside the boat. Guys have got him on the leader. I've gone, rightio. Jumped over to the side. Boat's out of gear. And there's a bit of current running. I spun around in front of it. And as soon as I've got in the water with this striped marlin, you can see him look at me going, what the hell? Now, I get that normally at the pub. Not in a good way. Slightly, you know, a little bit fat, that sort of stuff. But. This fish is looking at me. I thought it was a little bit weird. And he sucked right up, leaning right up along the boat. Normally they lie straight so and sit out from the boat a bit. But this one's tucked in tight against the boat. So I thought, ah, oh, no worries. So I've dived down. I've done some photos underneath. I've come up beside him. I've done from left to right. Doing all the shots, videoing it, filming it. Looking awesome. And I've dropped back. And the idea is that what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop back. They're going to release the fish because they're showing how you, you hold their head underwater. Because if a marlin's tired, you want to give them a second or two for respite. This is the part of it that you want them to, you know, just to relax. Get It's like running around the block three times. You just don't get chucked, do another round, start walking, you stop and have a breather. So you want the fish just to, to regain their energy a bit because they spend a bit fighting you. Because the funny thing is they don't feel pain. And this is something, this will be contentious with all these idiot greenies again, I know. With a circle hook, like with a VMC hooked in the corner of the mouth, it doesn't hurt the marlin, okay? What it does do, it's like a dog on a lead. Suddenly they're being pulled in a direction. They've never, or more a puppy really, because they don't understand. They don't realise what's going on. So the more you pull, the more they pull. So it's, it's that sort of scenario because the marlin's mouth is very hard. They eat spiky stuff. So it's not hurting them. It's just purely getting towed around. So fighting them, obviously they're tired. So you get them up beside the boat. And what you do is when they're really tired, these, I'm not talking about fish, marlin that you've got up really quickly in 10 minutes to the boat. You don't grab them by the bill because they're going to go bananas. But I'm talking about fish that have been a prolonged fight. They're worn out. It's like me doing 10, 10 laps of the oval instead of one. All right, hang on. Actually, that's maybe me just doing one lap of the oval. And so what you do is you grab them by the bill, but you hold them under the water. So what it does is just puts the water through the gills. That sounds really logical, doesn't it? But no, what does everyone do? They hold these poor fish up with their head in the air. For God's sake, they don't breathe air. Put their head under water. They wonder why these fish kick and carry on because they, they're tired. They want to breathe. They want some. They want the water over their gills. So the plan was to film that, show all that. So that's all done. 
Then the, the closing shot is that they're going to be releasing a little by the bill and they let go gently. I've dropped back and then I swim in and dive down and have this amazing shot. The fish is just tailing off gently into the blue yonder. Job done. Well, that sounded great, didn't it? So I've dropped back. I've got these grand ideas in my mind. And as I've done it, I've suddenly felt this almighty whoosh beside me, like something massive has charged past me. I'm only a metre or two from the fish, bear in mind. I've turned, there's nothing, and I've looked in front, and here is a massive mako attached to my marlin. And I'm staring at it. You know that moment where you're just trying to comprehend what's going on? I'm looking at it going, what? What is that? It's attached to my marlin. And then I'm looking up. But what made it worse, because when I look up, is that everyone in the boat is still holding the marlin totally unfazed. Because you know what? They had no idea this was going on. So I'm looking up at them, looking down below going, that's a massive shark. It's a massive shark. Why, why is no one reacting? And I look up. No, nope, they're all just cruising along. They had no idea that 300 kilos of mako was attached to their marlin. Like how bizarre is that? And it's amazing because the shark came in straight through the middle, grabbed the marlin in the middle and he's holding it, and then he mouthed his way down to the tail. At the same time, I'm sitting there just going, snap, 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 pick, 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 just shooting picks. Got the video going. And you have the one thing, and this is what everyone asked me, what was going through your head? And I go, God, I hope this is in focus. God, I hope this is in focus. And I'm just shooting away. And I, to be honest, I wasn't really scared because it's so surreal and it's eating the marlin. And you're just in this situation. You're a part of it. And so it's got down to the tail. When it hit the tail, the big old Mako's just crunched down and absolutely snapped the tail off. There's blood everywhere. The Mako swims down and away. The poor Marlin's done and dusted. And I'm sitting there. And then all of a sudden, I felt so lonely in the middle of the ocean. And that's when I got scared. And then I had to swim through all the blood to get into the boat. And do you know what? I'm going to tell you, if you ever want to win the Olympics in swimming, that is, just put a big mako in there. You should have seen the strides I had. Straight up and into the boat in a single motion. And the adrenaline's running. I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Like, it's amazing because I turned the other camera on as well. So it's got the whole lot, all everything in the boat, in the water, the whole lot. Like, how amazing is that? And it's, you know, we've got in the boat and I'm going, oh, and the funny thing is that now I'm panicking that I thought we were going to get a hard time because everyone's going to say, oh, you've killed a marlin, rah, rah, rah. You know, what he, so we thought, you know what? We'll go over to it and the poor marlin's dead by now. The shark's gone out because what happened is the shark bit the tail off. He can just let the, the poor marlin just, you know, die and he can just eat at his leisure then. So he doesn't need to worry about a big fat pink walrus thing paddling around the water, which was making him nervous. Because remember, when he attacks final stage of the attack when he's latched on the marlin he can't even see so imagine what he's thinking with me in the water oh poor i don't know what he's thinking i don't think it's good that's for sure so we've got it there and i've gone you know what this poor marlin's there dead next to us said all these years of all those sharks taxing my fish mainly up north you know your whalers and all that you know what i'm going to do let's tax it back so we went and got got the um the marlin filleted it down and then put the fillets in the, the Yeti there. It, it had all the ice in it. So we just put all the fillets straight on ice for smoking and then left the carcass to him. And I thought, you know what? About time we evened out this score. But even better is that I was doing a, a show for Current Affair on Channel 9. And what it is is, you know, the perfect life, you know, the perfect job, all that sort of thing. It's a pretty weak story. So we rang the producer, Justin Kelly. And I said, oh, mate, mate, I'm up on, I'm out fishing. Um, we just had this massive mako attack at attack the poor old marlin and he goes oh that sounds good that might add a bit of spice to the story and i went yeah yeah when it pushes me out of the way it looks unreal and he goes what do you mean pushes you out of the way where are you and i said i'm in the water he goes there's dead silence absolute dead silence what do you mean you're in the water i said i was in the water he pushed me out of the way and you can see it from the camera above and i've got the camera on underneath and he's going are you serious you are in the water with a massive mako and it's all on camera and i went yeah and he's going Oh my God, he goes, I can't believe this. He goes, you've got to come straight in. I'll get the camera crew up there. And I go, no, 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 she's right, mate. Two hours, the tide change. We're going to catch a couple more marlin. And hung up. He rang back and he rang back and he rang back. And we caught a couple more marlin and then went home. So the next day, 
I sent the footage down to him, rang up Mal Holland, my mate at the Daily Telegraph, said, listen, Mal, got a really good photo. Do you want it? He's gone, yep. So did a deal with Channel 9 for the footage. They've got the camera crew up the next morning, did the whole interview. The family's come up because, like, it was full-on interviews all day and exclusives, etc., etc. And that night, the Friday night, it went to air, and the Friday morning, it came out as the cover shot or the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Like, how insane is that? And the funny thing is, I still remember to this day, we're sitting on the beach there at Little Beach. Now, Little Beach at Port Stephens is the beach that they put the sanctuary zone around. You remember before I was talking about that these draconian, Nazi-like Marine Parks officers used to patrol it? Well, that's where they were. So we're sitting at the beach and, you know, no one was there that day. No, well, no, Marine Parks officers. So they book these poor people going in. So families that have been fishing that have got a hook on their line, they go to pull the boat out and they get booked and charged with criminal offences. Only in Australia. Only in Australia. It's unreal. So we're just chilling out on the beach. And Cooper wanders off. Now, Cooper's my younger one who's mad keen fisher and hunter. And he wanders off. He's only four or five at this stage, maybe six. God, I can't even remember how old. Uh, yeah, probably about five or six. And he wanders off and comes back to me and goes, Dad, come and meet this lady. So I've walked over. Now, everyone's got the paper open, the Daily Telegraph. And, of course, it's got the shot, this infamous shot with the Mako rolled over and eating the marlin as the front page. And he goes, this is my daddy took the photo that you're saying is fake. What type of introduction is that? Poor old lady doesn't know. Of course it looks fake. It's it's an unbelievable shot, if I might say so myself. I went, no, no, I actually took that photo. And then within minutes, I'm swarmed with all these people. Now, I just wanted to chill that day after the day before where I've got to do interviews and everything all day long. And all of a sudden, I'm doing, even signing the paper, for God's sake. It was ridiculous. But the fallout, or should I say the response, was what was overwhelming. Now, a majority of people came going, that's spectacular. A lot said, oh, it's a fake photo, that sort of thing. But... The concerning part was the radical terrorists like Greens that just came up with the dumbest comments on earth. Like this, I can't believe you towed that poor innocent fish out of the estuary where it's safe into the open ocean where there are sharks. Oh my God, are you serious? Can you be that dumb in the world? Like, that's the problem with social media. We're letting the dumb people that should never have a voice, they get a voice. Because someone like that, what is wrong with them? How can they say that when they have no idea what they're talking about? You know, and other people saying, I can't believe you caught that poor marlin and towed it around till a shark ate it. Here we are with fisheries, with water police, professional deckhand, trying to show people how to look after these fish. And we end up having that amazing moment. I know it was spectacular, but we're trying to look after the fish. But you, it's still nature at the end of the day. You can't change it. And to me, it's so frustrating because it was such an amazing moment for me. And yes, there was real sadness. Like, I've got mixed emotions. That poor Marlon dying, it's just, you know. But to be there and see a Mako of that size, so close, and doing what it does naturally, rocked my world. It was just unreal. And best of all, I've got the photos to prove it. And now, I sit there and on my wall, I've got the yellow fin from Ascension, I've got the marlin getting speared, or the marlin spearing the bloke, turning the tables, the marlin getting eaten by the mako, the giant squid. These four memorable moments that have really, in nature, you just go, holy moly, they're standout moments. That's what it is, they're standout moments. And that, for me, is what it's all about. Because I look at that, I've got those yellowfin right here in front of me, I look at it going, God, I, well, I, I wished I was there. And that's what taking photos and filming is all about, making people want to go there and look after it. And yeah, the funny part, that marlin never made the cut in the Game Fishing Australia DVD. It wasn't quite up to scratch, that poor fish. So we kept him out of it, that's for sure. But you know what? That's it. I'm packing the Mitzi. I'm going south because it's time to catch the marlin. It's time to start fishing. And next week, and going forward, tell me what you guys want. We're already getting lots of response. Everyone wants a show about marlin. So I will do a marlin one. Let's do one about plastic and what Yeti and Costa and all these really good companies are doing to help us look after plastic in the ocean. Let's go and look at simple ones like flatties, taking your kids fishing. You tell me what you want and I'll talk about it. But for now, it's time to go fishing. Fishing is my 
my life. It's in my DNA. From above the water and below the surface. It's who I am. Join me as I travel the world in search of the most insane fishing experiences on the planet. You got it. Oh, yeah. Big fish right there, Al. Yeah, baby. The size of it. I'm Alan McGlashan and this is Fishing With Mates. Yahoo!